Welcome to the very dedicated who are here with us today, all six or seven of us. Thank you, thank you for being here. Is this okay then, or all right? So we're, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and I think fire away and be, begin things. Um, uh, my name my name is Brent Hawkins, and I'm a I'm a lawyer, so I have no place on this panel. Um, I do a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and that's what this this panel is about. And I have kind of the rare privilege of being on this panel with three people that I really admire a lot and have worked with closely. And I'll let them kind of tell their stories as, uh, as they go. I won't try to botch it for them. So maybe, Rod, do you want to tell your story? Yeah, uh, Rod Stewart, I think I know several of you uh, from, from various parts of life. Uh, my, my background is varied. I started, started with Price Waterhouse, spent uh, another four years with Deloitte. Uh, moved into software and uh, really got, got the case for mergers and acquisitions when we sold, sold our business to Symantec. This is 15, 18 years ago. Uh, from that, that point on, I uh, worked for Symantec, is, had to have their SEC practice, uh, did, did a lot of uh, their, their one-off transactions, mergers and acquisition work for, for Symantec Corporation. Uh, took a international uh, finance director role, uh, tra traveled the world, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, my wife and kids asked me to uh, be home on occasion. And so I uh, jumped, jumped over to a small company uh, by the name of Handstands, uh, where we were getting into the automotive uh, aftermarket space, um, you know, consumer packaged goods with automotive air fresheners. Uh, we built the nation's largest automotive air freshener company and sold that to uh, Energizer Batteries in 2016. Uh, from there, uh, we've orchestrated a management buyout from uh, Energizer and got into the promotional products uh, uh, world uh, and transacted that, that business at the end of 2018. Uh, stayed on with Hub Promotional Group. They're, they're the ninth largest provider of uh, promotional products across the United States. Stayed on as their chief operating officer. Uh, managing uh, roughly a thousand employees across nine, nine manufacturing locations in the U.S. and in Canada, and uh, took, took a retirement stand a year ago, and joined with Cold Tech Refrigeration last December uh, in, in a uh, turnaround situation. Uh, we've turned the business around in our uh, now we're down the rapid growth phase. Uh, completed our first acquisition uh, last Friday. Uh, trying to wrap up two, two additional acquisitions uh, in the next 10 days. I uh, see Ken Van Leeuwen over here. Ken, Ken's our CFO and uh, is very, very busy keeping everything go going on the finance front uh, for, for these transactions. So uh, we're doing, doing a nation, well, Western United States roll up uh, with, within uh, commercial heating, air conditioning, and refrigeration. So, thank you. Jeremy Baker, we, uh, I'm with Auto Savvy, we used to be uh, Auto Source, we just recently changed our name. We st I founded the company with a college roommate of mine about 15 years ago. We were still in college when we got it rolling. It's, uh, it's the, we're the nation's largest brand in tile specific uh, auto dealership. So uh, we kind of invented, we feel like we kind of invented this, uh, this sub market in the used car space. So you can get so you can get an affordable new car for, for less money. We started this, uh, so we started small in the uh, in Utah, uh, and uh, kind of, we started other business, and we were interested in, in, in other opportunities, and we were, you know, entrepreneurs at heart. Uh, I did a master's degree in accounting, but I never, I never, uh, I did the accounting degree mainly as a, uh, as a necessity because my, my partner was kind of the front man salesman. So I needed to take care of the finance uh, side of the business. We, uh, we started an auto transport company in 2007, uh, built that, sold that uh, a little while later. 2008, when fuel prices went crazy and we were kind of leading into a recession, uh, we started a natural gas conversion company called Four Natural in 
you're not a specialist in uh, private wealth. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, uh, oh, are you going to push the button? But uh, maybe, Jeremy, from your perspective, maybe just kind of take us through, kind of start with maybe some of the, some of the steps or some of the first things that happened in your tra in transaction, how you went about doing that with the other owners, and, and maybe set the stage for us. We'll talk, I think, for much of this discussion about, about just the, the steps of a transaction, how a good CFO, and these three are excellent CFOs, can really lead a company through what can be a very difficult and distracting and time-consuming and brain-damaging process. Yeah, so uh, the process for us took, uh, we started it, we started talking about it in 2013. So we, we ended up transacting in 2018. So it took us a long time. We only had, uh, you know, we had decided, we had one small store in, uh, in Woods Cross, or right next to Woods Cross High School, if, if, for those of you who know where, where that is. Uh, we had that one store, and, uh, but <clears throat> we knew that there, the barriers to entry into our space are so big. You know, if you're, a, if you're a regular consumer, you're trying to buy a car that's got a branded title, you walk into uh, to any bank. Usually, they say, "Look, we don't we won't finance a branded title, or they'll have some some discount applied to that." Early on, we were able to get partnerships with with some large credit unions, regional credit unions that uh, that would, would allow us to kind of grow. Uh, so, in in, in uh, 
with that, uh, getting over that hurdle, we were able to start really growing it. We knew we had something that didn't exist out, that didn't exist anywhere yet. And so we started, uh, uh, we did a review financial in 2014. Uh, that was the, we didn't have really any debt. We, 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 used, uh, we used our own capital uh, as we started, we started slow and as we grew, we just, we just uh, invested our own capital. And so we didn't have any of those bank uh, uh, covenants that we needed to abide by up until this point. So as we uh, we got a review financial for the first time, 2015 we started doing audited financials so that we would have, the idea was to have three years of, or two years of audited financials by the time we, we kind of packaged this up and, and started talking to private equity or strategic buyers. And are you glad you did that, Jeremy, in retrospect? Oh was that, was gosh, that yeah, that was, uh, I thought I knew how to be an accountant until, until we started doing that, so, uh, which was really good, so. Yeah, that's a pretty critical, you'd say, kind of first step. You, you needed that, we needed that. So another thing that we did that, that wasn't typical, we found out, or maybe it is typical, but we were told that it's, uh, uh, it wasn't needed, it was we did a quality of earnings so that we felt like we could control the narrative when, when the private equity or the, or the strategic partners come in, because and, and, they're gonna do it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> we felt like we wanted to control that narrative. So we did a, we started with review financials, did audit financials, we did a quality of earnings. Before we even uh, had a, had a, had a uh, uh, investment banking firm. So, uh, you know, we, 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 our attorney was kind of the first advisor group that we decided on uh, as we as we were working towards and, 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 and growing the business we had three four or five stores uh, and we, were, we were profitable we, uh, <clears throat> I started coming to conferences like this to, to try to engage myself in, in what the M&A world looked like because we were we were really isolated we were operators and so I was I felt like I was doing the CFOing on the side while we were doing Everything else with the business. Um, could, I, could I ask a question just for uh, in, those of you in, in the audience? How many of you have ever been through a quality of earnings audit? So you know what they are. Okay. If you don't know what a quality of earnings audit is, um, it's completely different than a regular audit. So, anyway. Yeah. Hey, don't speak to that, Al. Continue. Oh. So those of you who have not been through a quality of earnings uh, audit, um, a normal audit is verifying that what you say is on the financials is actually there. A quality of earnings audit addresses more the why. Why do you have earnings? So for example, you might think you're doing really well as your sales are growing 20% a year and uh, your earnings are growing and meanwhile, a quality of earnings audit team might come in and they will look at you and say, well, 70% of your business comes from Costco, therefore, it could disappear quickly, and so we will devalue your earnings by 40%. And they'll make some valuation effort. If your customers are churning over each year, so you're not retaining them, they might take a discount for that. So they look at the why of why you are earning money and how you are earning money and a quality of earnings audit <clears throat> can surprise you, especially if your owners are used to things always being that way and they're banking on a certain multi multiple of each dollar because everybody's told them that's what they're gonna do. And I guess, you know, maybe turn the mic over to Rod. Um, these things, review financials, quality of earnings, don't make sense for every business. When do you think they should apply as you're aiming towards sale? Or what size of business or what kind of business should you consider doing that? Yeah. For, for, me, for me, it does depend on the size. It really comes down to what, what is the exit. If there is no, is, is there an exit or not? Uh, when, when I first joined Handstands, there were five of us that, that owned the business. Uh, we had no intention of, of selling, we had no intention of buying. In fact, I, I sat in one of our major competitors who's owned by Shell Oil Company. Uh, they went up for sale about six months after I joined, joined the company and I, I made the mistake of suggesting a board meeting that perhaps we'd become a buyer of, uh, of, of the company that they, they were selling. And the found, founder's hands hit the table 
uh, had started sort of rolling, and I was almost exited that day for suggesting that we triple the size of the business inside the first year. Uh, so, extremely conservative group. They did not want to sell, they did not, not want to exit. Uh, from that perspective, we said, look, what is the minimum that the bank will require in order to keep, keep a line, line of credit going? And we just stay, stay with the review. Uh, it wasn't until a few years, years later where I could see that there's a disparity between uh, some of the se senior founders who were appro approaching retirement age and some of us who, who were younger who were driving the building business that I then talked talk them into starting the op process so that we could pre prepare for uh, what, what eventually was, was the pri private equity uh, fund funding it was. So, yeah, I think understanding the partners, understanding the founders, what are, what are their, what is their game plan. Uh, today for Cold Tech, we're, we're entering that business with the intent to sell the business. And so the, this, this is, is a large, large scale roll up. And so we're, we're started year one with this, this go, go ahead and, and get the audits, have everything prepared. So if we exit three years or 10 years, whatever that, that period of time is, we're, we're ready for the exit when it comes. I guess as, as you guys are CFOs, you are the kind of connection point between, uh, between the company on the one hand, the folks that you work with and for, and, and those outside accountants who may be providing the review for audit financials or, or the quality of earnings. And so you play a key role kind of bridging that divide and working with the constituents in the company and, and uh, advisors outside the company to make that happen. Another thing that's kind of hard to know, at least for me, and, and, uh, is, is when, do you, when do you choose to bring on outside help to do a, to do a deal? Like when do you choose to, for example, choose to engage in an investment banker? Um, any thoughts on that, Al? For, <clears throat> based on my experience, um, the minute you think you're going to sell, you ought to start bringing in outside help. And you probably should start with an attorney who's done a deal and uh, understands some of the things you'll be facing. Did I see a hand? Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Al. No, no, you please ask me a question. Well, that, I wanted to ask that question, but maybe with just one level of specificity. As, please. As Utah-based companies, um, your, and I didn't get every factor, I know how, but as a Utah-based company, what did it look like to you going to look for investment banking help, the local community versus have to go out to the coast or back east, or just kind of how that landscape looked when you were thinking about engaging in investment banking? Okay, so uh, I, I think you have a two-part question. One is um, the determination of how you're going to sell. If your current shareholders want to go through a process, process meaning I'm going to cast a wide net across the nation or somewhere, then your first, uh, your first attempt at finding an investment banker should be who can I find in my industry that handles deals of this size? Because similar to car dealerships and every other type of business, there are people who focus on certain segments and certain sizes. <clears throat> so um, uh, on the other hand, if your owners or people do not want to go through a process, then chances are you can use a local investment banker without any problem because they will know most of the local people or you find an investment banker that's specifically identified to your industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I mean, we, we, we started the conversation with private with local uh, investment bankers and realized right away that the expertise that we were looking for wasn't uh, maybe there was more that we could have talked to, uh, for sure, but <clears throat> so we started doing our own research, asking around, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and was pointed in the right direction right away, and ended up being firms out of Chicago, or out of Boston, uh, etc. So, uh, so we, we brought them in, and, and, and 
interviewed a handful. We didn't just say, these are the expert. We, we made them pitch to us. To say, look, we, we, we already, we, we missed at the table. We, we missed at the table. We've done this deal and this deal and this deal. Your deal looks similar, so uh, uh, these were the results. So we, we, we spent some, a lot of time uh, picking, really, each one of our advisors. We just, in, in addition to the attorneys, we ended up with BTJD, which was, which was phenomenal, because they were local, but we did talk to the Kirkland Ellis and the, and the big firms that, that handle transactions like that. Uh, uh, just before we get to you, Rob, one of the very interesting things uh, that I've noticed over the years working with good investment bankers is they will ask questions that will warp your mind and they will analyze the business like you've never seen it. They have a whole cadre of folks just getting out of business school and all they do is financial analysis and spreadsheets and they will ask you questions and you look at them and you think, what, what relevance does that piece of information have? And, and you will learn quite a bit about your business if you get the right investment bank. So. Yeah, I've sold businesses on my own uh, and with investment bankers. Investment bankers definitely the way, the way to go. Uh, point, point I was going to make, uh, when we sold handstands a second time, private, our private equity partners wanted to use the bankers that they were used to using. Uh, who did not have industry expertise, and we, we had a board level, uh, I won't call it a fight, but it was, it was certainly weeks of deliberation back and forth on who should we use. And we ended up with a small boutique firm out, out of New York uh, who knew the automotive aftermarket very, very well, uh, had, had transacted uh, almost everything in the space. And so, so very contrary, especially to the man managing partner of the large private equity fund, fund that, that we were doing business with, we, we ended up with, with this new New York boutique firm. We skipped, we, we, we decided to two-step the process and said we're going to do fireside chats with primary uh, investors. So we met, we met, met with, uh, you know, S.C. Johnson, uh, with, with Pinkle, with, you know, the, the who's who in consumer packaged goods, who this small boutique firm, 10, 12 guys, had the connections with every major consumer package company across the United States. And we said, if we do not get the valuation we want there, then we'll cast, cast them broad now. Uh, we ended up meet, meeting with, I believe it was, it was eight fireside chats, had, had five offers. And, and we're able to, to streamline what typically is a six, nine month process into about a three month process, which allowed us to continue to focus on the business while, while giving the shareholders an eight times return in you know, a three year period now. So, so great, great advantages in finding the right banker and not, not just saying, well, here's a big name uh, who may not have, have any relevance within the space. Yeah, thank, thanks for those comments. I'd add maybe just two little ones. One is, you know, I, I don't know what the right kind of dollar threshold is for selecting an investment bank, but I think probably for deals less than 25 million, probably not. Um, but even so, if I had a business, I would want to have investment bankers as friends. I would pick their brains. I would ask them to pitch me. I would say, hey, give me your best shot. What are multiples of my space? What are issues? Who are players because most investment bankers are looking for work, right? And they will do a lot of work for you before you engage them. They're not cheap, right? No, they, take, they take a lot more money than before attorneys take in a deal, even though we do all the work. So I can I can you do all the work. Well except except for you yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So so I guess my pitch is I would say use an investment bank, not abuse them, but use them to kind of understand your business because like Al said you know, they will, they will bring you insights into your business that you were not aware of before. They will identify things that your competitors are doing well or poorly. They'll help you with elements like that that are really useful. That, that's my, my quick take on investment banks. Are they good? I guess if they, if they provide more value than you would have if you did it yourself, yes. If not, then no. And you take your best shot at that question on the front end, right? And you hope that you're right. You know, and you, Please do not sign investment banking engagement letters without talking to your counsel because they can be pretty tricky. That's a bad play. That's why I think you should pick a, a, a counsel that's 
counsel first. And, and in fact, you know, good counsel will help you in, in thinking about some of those issues. I know, you know, in, in Jeremy's case, I think we introduced the investment banks that the investment bank that, that auto stores and auto said they went with. Good folks, and I think that there was good service provided. So all that happens, and I would say there's quite a few people that I've worked with that don't really understand the importance of that letter of intent that comes across the board. I don't know if any of you have had experience with letters of intent, but could you give us a good experience about what a letter of intent really means? Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak about this from, from my, my side uh, with, with the roll-ups roll that we're doing. Uh, really, the letter of intent is the blueprint for everything else in that transaction. Uh, we'll oftentimes have, have uh, sellers come back and say, well, we want to do the transaction this way. We'll go, hey, sorry, three months ago you signed a letter of intent that said we were going to do it this other direction. So, so having a proper letter of intent, making sure your attorney has been through it, making sure that, that you really have all the details worked out. If your letter of intent says something like, we'll figure it out later, uh, that should not be the letter of intent. Uh, because in the heart of the deal, when, when a seller is, has all their passion flowing, they're frustrated, they're, they're about to kill you because you want you have 75 pages of schedules as part of the you know, 112 page legal document and they're trying to run, run their business, figuring out then will blow up the deal. So, so letter of intent is, is absolutely key to make sure that you document how you're going to do a deal, what it looks like, down, down to, to every point you can think, think about there. And then you always have something to go back and say, you know, we're not trying to rip you off. We aren't doing something shady here. We're going back to what we all agreed upon when we, we had clear heads to think. So there aren't clear heads during transactions? Rarely. <laughs> well, that, that's a good, I guess, segue. I guess you got the letter of intent, it's signed now. What happens next as part of the deal, Jeremy? Where do you, where do you go from there? Yeah, so from there, uh, I mean, you've, you've hopefully had the data room already set up uh, as, as, as the as the, you know, you get an investment banker, you create a SIM, and uh, that goes out to, you know, a bunch of different parties. <clears throat> Hopefully you have the data room by now, so you're putting financials in there, you're putting schedules, you're putting all of your, all of your legal documents in there. Uh, and from there it's working, so it, the letter of intent is, I don't know, three, four pages, and then uh, you'll, that is the, that's the backbone of a 120 page, uh, purchase agreement, and so that's that's where you're going from there. And, and, and every uh, you know, ours took. We signed a letter of intent uh, in about the end of January, and we ended up closing May second. So you know that took March, April. So that took three months, uh, <clears throat> which I think was longer than we anticipated. You know, we had uh, you know you know they come up with uh, every day you're fulfilling. Uh, requests, right? So, so they're looking through the data room. They're asking questions every day, and uh, and really, for me, in uh, in my role at the company, I mean, it, it virtually changed from from the time that we uh, we signed a letter of intent or even started the, the marketing process for our company. I was just fulfilling requests and answering questions, and uh, and so it, it really was evident that we needed, uh, you know, we we had to work, really work on our bench to fulfill the day-to-day -day of the company. So a lot of data requests, a lot of Q&A for that three-month period, asking more detailed questions on the diligence. Yeah, you, you talk, talk a little bit about, about the data room. Uh, as soon as CFOs, my, my expectation, having been a CFO, having been in the CEO chair and, and in other, other C-suite positions, organize your data so it's easy to pull. Uh, everything from your financial data, your transactional data, your contracts. Uh, to me, to me, it become becomes key for the CFO to be able to have things get organized. Otherwise, pulling the data rooms together uh, is just an absolute nightmare. If if you decide you're going to market, you hire a banker, 
and your financials are not very clean. And, and I don't, I don't view a past an audit as clean financials. Uh, just passing it out, that's, that's, that's great. That, that's a minimum bar, bar in my view. But actually having the data in, in a format that you can hand it over to an investment banker and still see your family, right? And, you know, I've, I've had, I've had uh, the, uh, you know, 60 days of not being home, uh, sleeping under my desk, uh, you know, just spend, spending two months at the office you know, walk out, you, you look, look like a vampire at the end of the day, uh, experiences. And I've had those experiences where I learned from that, uh, that torture, organized up front, is that every piece of data, every contract that comes in, we're going to organize it inside the business. If we need to buy software to organize it, we're going to do that. And all of a sudden you're going, well, yeah, I'm working through a transaction, and there's a few extra hours during the week. Uh, but but you, you can still keep on life balance. I think that's that's great advice, and I try to tell the clients that are even thinking about a sale. I, I always I send them about a ten-page due diligence checklist and say, organize yourselves this way. Create an electronic repository of all these documents, organized by file file type, and have that ready to go because it's going to save you, I think, a lot of pain and ugliness, and you won't look stupid, right, to an investment bank or an acquirer or other party later. You look like you'll have your stuff together. Um, to so it's pretty critical in my view, and it's, and it's a great way along with reviewed financials and maybe all of earnings and toward preparing for an acquisition that may be on the distant horizon. Yeah, one thing that, <clears throat> just kind of speaking of that diligence, uh, one thing that we, that we uh, didn't really have put together was, uh, was, was a five-year kind of model. Uh, you know, this is, all of us as CFOs, you know, we're, we live in Excel. <clears throat> and uh, and we you know as we you know we realized we had uh, uh, a promising company and we could grow it and etc. We didn't have a really detailed model of what it looks like you know when we put store number six and seven and twenty five and thirty uh, and so building that really detailed model you know when we sent that over to the investment banker uh, you know as we, after we signed with them. You know, they were happy to see that because you know we got comments like, "Hey, usually, often we have to create this ourselves, so save a lot of time and and uh, and, and ambiguity from from them trying to create it versus coming from the house." If I could say something about a five-year financial, go for it. They're really Avoid hockey sticks. Um, it sure is amazing. How many businesses, when they present a five-year financial, are going to double their sales and double their earnings in five years? And the owners believe it. And so then I would ask them, so why particularly are you selling? Right? And so um, when you uh, put together a five-year forecast, uh, you've got to be able to look at industry statistics. You've got to be able to look at the performance of your own sales team and your actual um, growth of what is actually happening. Because the minute you release a projection, then your results in a month or in two months are going to be compared to that projection. And so as a CFO or a CEO or anything else, you've got to make sure that during the transaction process, you are hitting whatever numbers are in that forecast. Otherwise, you lose credibility. And they won't even believe, if you can't hit the next three months, they will not believe four years out. And so you'll be at a competitive disadvantage. There's that balance between kind of the CEO's role to be the visionary and the CFO's role to the degree of being credible, isn't there? Yep. I have a question. Yep. So, I mean, given the market conditions right now, especially, what are the key indicators you look for to get an acquisition of our sales? Who do you want to cut? And how do you know? I'll take. One of the times I know that a business needs to be sold 
as if there's going to be a significant investment in infrastructure to grow and your current shareholders will need to make a four or five year commitment. So before then, you can just be growing along and everything is fine. Uh, and then many businesses hit a plateau. And now to get to the next level, you're either gonna be bringing on additional senior executives or additional people to be trained, or you've gotta bring on a, a whole lot of locations to really grow, you've got to do something like that. That to me is a sign you ought to consider selling because there's somebody who can take that to the next level with their infrastructure. Those will be the strategic buyers that will be there. Another time to sell is when uh, you're growing so fast you just can't take it. I mean, it's, it's too much. And uh, unless you want to stay on being overwhelmed, then you've got to sell because you just don't have the, the capacity to meet all the liquidity requirements that are going to be needed because you're growing. So those are two things that I look for. We, uh, we, we got to the point where we wanted and needed industry experts uh, in the space. So we were car dealership at, 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 when it's all said and done and neither, none of us had come from the industry. So there's a lot of best practices, a lot of uh, industry-specific stuff that we felt like we needed. We got to the to the size that uh, we felt like we were trying to recreate what had already been created by a number of operators. And so we, we want to bring in some expertise, knowing that you know, we felt like we could take this nationwide, et cetera, that you know, nobody's done it yet, and, uh, and we, needed, we needed expertise to scale it. I've, I've seen various examples here. Uh, with, with when we sold Altera software, we we hit a point we were publicly traded. We were approaching the three three hundred billion revenue mark, and we were fighting against the uh, you know the mammoths in the industry. So we we had taken the business, and all of a sudden, in order to really take the business to the next level, it was either joined with a Symantec. Uh, who at the time, time was $7 billion and the fourth largest software company in the world to really accelerate what we, what we had or fight against this man tech. And $300 million is a good sized company, but when you're going up against, against a $7 billion company, it's difficult. In the automotive aftermarket space, we, we looked at it uh, with, with the uh, refresher car brands. We were a small company in Salt Lake City, Utah. We had done phenomenally well, but Febreze is entering the marketplace. SC John Johnson's kind of coming in, and, and these companies that had kind of left the space alone for several years, all of a sudden were doubling down. And Febreze's marketing budget was more than our annual revenue, right? All of a sudden you're saying, okay, how, how does a you know, 140, 150 million revenue company in Salt, Salt Lake City compete at that at that level. And so th those were some, some of the, the, the factors. Now, the decision points to bring in private equity to expand the growth, uh, speed up the growth, right? That very, very different. Uh, the both, both, the, both of those other exits were, what, what is the competitive force and what, what do we see, see on, on the horizon? Some within, within uh, the automotive space said, hey, you made a mistake, you should have continued to, to build this company. Uh, we looked at it and said, what, what are, is the return to shareholders today? What is the risk of getting more or higher return to shareholders in the future? Let's take, take a safe, safe bet and, and re return, return to capital with, with a phenomenal return uh, and not take, not take the risk of you know, going up, up against a reason. Just one more thought, because um, I address the sales side. On the buy side, it's if you are running uh, some type of operation and you can see that buying poorly run operations can get you expansion much faster than what you could do from a green deal. So it, it's identifying uh, buy opportunities that you would know how to run. So. 
And there's a lot, there's a lot more that we could address. There's the whole question of, of kind of how a CFO can act with it or can help a board and a company kind of get through negotiations and the like. But we're also kind of running short on time. I think we're ending at 120. So maybe we'll just take a break right now and see if anyone has any questions they'd like to pose to the panel. Any questions? For any of you that took a private equity money, now looking back in the review, good move, bad move, things you do differently? I would say mixed. Uh, when we initially sold handstands and brought on, brought on our private equity partner, fantastic move, phenomenal move. Uh, we were able to diversify the se senior uh, founders out of the business, uh, set up their retirement fund. We, we did retain 45% ownership in that company. Uh, and so, so kind of that second bite of the apple, which, which was great, great for, for those guys. Uh, with the carved out that I bought bought from Energizer uh, upon that exit, right? They're, they're still nice. My wife and I say, should we have just kept that business for another another few years now? Again, great great financial return, but we, we were having a, a very good time uh, running that business. Uh, and so take, taking on on the private equity money uh, added some, some nice things for the business, but as a personal business owner, of a small small business, um, you know there, there are time, times that I you know, still sit back, sit back and second guess that. So I think think the advice that I would give is who is the private equity partner? How sharp are their elbows? Are they working to build the business, or are they just bring, bringing in uh, running the business by spreadsheet, forgetting the human element of the business? Right? Uh, private private equity fund that I work work for now does a phenomenal job in allowing me to run the company from the personnel side, right? Being, being, being in the blue color trades at this stage of my life, everything is about, about the people. Uh, there are not enough enough techs, there are not enough tradesmen out there and our company, our, our techs can leave tomorrow and have a new, new job on new. So uh, where, where several of our competitors have a wrong that are, are bringing in private equity money is private equity groups are simply managing from the spreadsheet, forgetting the human capital element, forgetting the, the boots on the ground discussions, and, and simply trying to, try to make, make a return from the glass office in Chicago. Uh, I'm looking at that as a CEO and saying thank you for doing that, because it's, it's created a huge competitive advantage for those of us that still believe, believe in local, local management, local decision, local, local people. So, it really depends who you bring in. Yeah, just a quick follow up. One of the hardest things to figure out from a private equity group is uh, how they manage the companies in their portfolio. Some take a very hands on approach. Others, it's almost as if they give you the money and they attend board meetings and you either perform or fire. And so the key is to try to discern how they are going to manage uh, their portfolio. And that's hard. I think that's key, though. I mean, we looking back for us, <clears throat> we don't have any regrets for, but, but I think it's because we went with the right private equity partner, right? So we've heard of the horror stories of, of the wrong PE firm, and, uh, and I've talked to many who have gone through that experience. We gratefully uh, uh, went with the right one, uh, Caroline, so we went down there. But for sure, no regrets. I think it was the right move for us, definitely. This is a market where there's a lot of capital chasing deals, and so certainly private equity firms expect to be vetted, right? And, and, and certainly investors expect to be vetted, so you can ask questions and ask references from them just as they are from you. And the best ones, the best ones do that. And we did, we call, we call a number of companies that for, for multiple private equity firms to get that, that process. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Any, Final words, Rod. Enjoy what you do. Life, life is way, way too short to not, not enjoy it. So, uh, if, if you love building businesses, you love buying and selling businesses, put yourself in that position. If buying and selling businesses keeps you up at night, stresses you out, uh, there's lots of fantastic CFO opportunities that don't have that stress point. But find, find your passion and follow it. I, I 
would echo that. The artist, the artist's most stressful period for me was post transaction, uh, actually. So uh, you know, it, life doesn't change. Post transaction, it gets uh, it, for me, it got worse. And so I had to, uh, I had to uh, step away from the CFO role to to find greater happiness. Actually, so. yeah, I would just say uh, through it all, your luck, you. Your career in life will be good, providing you have liquidity. It doesn't matter what private equity firm or how you buy or sell. If there's no cash, it's not fun. Well, thanks. Thanks to this panel, we'll wrap it up and uh, and call it a call it a show. These are these are three great CFOs. Some of them have transitioned away from being CFOs to CEO. So I think their advice pertains to all industries, all spaces. If you are lucky enough to nap them after this, you should and ask them further questions and, and get their insights. Thank you.